Lecture 6 on the Mysterious Darkness of the Third Degree The pale beam struggled through the shade that blackened the cavern's womb and in the deepest nook betrayed an altar and a tomb. Around the tomb in mystic lore were forms of various men and F's and foul-winged serpents bore the altar's base obscene. Mickle by the dispensations of an all-wise providence, it is ordained that a state of darkness resembling death shall precede the attainment of all the different degrees of perfection. Thus, the dense vacuum of chaos introduced the formation of the world as it came from the hand of its maker, pure and perfect. Thus, the whole creation annually sinks into itself. The trees are stripped of their leafy covering, the waters are locked up in the frost of winter, and nature seems consigned to the embraces of darkness and death. But this dreary pause is only a fit preparation for the revival of the new year, when the earth again displays her charms and cheers us with all the animation and glory of a revived existence. Thus, also man, the nobler work of the deity, is subject every day to an oblivion of sense and reflection, which, however, serves but to invigorate his faculties and restore to reason all its energy and force. And thus, even death itself, though terrible in prospect, is but the prelude to our restoration in a more improved state, when eternity shall burst upon us in full effulgence and all the glories of absolute perfection encircle us forever. In like manner, the emblematical darkness of masonry is but the precursor of superior illumination, and hence our science is aptly denominated lux, or light, because it removes the mist of error and prejudice from the understanding and leaves the soul open to impressions which awaken all the energies of faith and hope and charity. This light is partly communicated by the assistance of hieroglyphical emblems, for masonry, correctly defined, is a beautiful system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. Thus, if we wish to recommend justice and morality, we point to the square, which is the emblem of these virtues. If equality be our theme, the level is displayed. If integrity, the plum. Do we wish to illustrate our respective duties to God and man? The three great lights are on the pedestal and are easily brought before the active mason's view, and the three lesser lights point out the excellent scheme of government adopted by our ancient brethren and still practiced in our lodges. Do we enlarge upon a life well spent in acts of piety and devotion? The perfect ashlar is the elucidating emblem. If we refer to the comfort and perfection of God's revealed word, it is done through the medium of the tracing board. If the pure and perfect road to heaven be the subject of our lecture, we have a ladder composed of staves or rounds innumerable, each pointing out some moral or theological virtue. And even when elevating our thoughts to the deity himself, our eyes involuntarily rest on the glory in the center. Then, with hearts overflowing with gratitude and love, we bow reverentially before the all-seeing eye of God, which the sun, moon, and stars obey, conscious that it pervades their inmost recesses and tries our thoughts, words, and actions by the unerring touchstone of truth and eternal justice. In the ancient mysteries, the epoptes, or perfectly initiated aspirants, were reputed to have attained a state of pure and ineffable light, and pronounced safe under the protection of the celestial gods. While the unhappy multitude who had not undergone the purifying ceremonies were declared reprobate, said to wander in all the obscurity of darkness, to be deprived of the divine favor and doomed to a perpetual residence in the infernal regions amidst a cheerless and overwhelming contamination.
During the Persian initiations, this doctrine was enforced ex cathedra. The Archimagus informed the candidate at the moment of illumination that the divine lights were displayed before him, and after explaining the nature and purport of the mysteries in general, he taught that the universe was governed by a good and evil power who were perpetually engaged in contest with each other, and as each in turn prevailed, the world was characterized by a corresponding succession of happiness and misery, that uninitiated and immoral men were votaries of the evil power, and the virtuous initiated of the good. And at the end of the world, each with his followers will go into a separate abode. The latter with Yazdan shall ascend by means of a ladder to a state of eternal light, where exist unalloyed happiness and the purest pleasures. The former with Ariman shall be plunged into an abode of darkness, where they shall suffer an eternity of disquietude and misery. In a desolate place of punishment, situated on the shore of a stinking river, the waters of which are black as pitch and cold as ice. Here the souls of the uninitiated eternally float. Dark columns of smoke ascend from this stream, the inside of which is full of serpents, scorpions, and venomous reptiles. The multitude, being thus amused with fables and terrified with denunciations, were effectually involved in uncertainty and directed to paths where error only could be found. For every proceeding was mysterious and every mythological doctrine shrouded under a corresponding symbol. These allegorical fables becoming popular, the simple rites of primitive worship soon assumed a new and more imposing form and religion was at length enveloped in a veil so thick and impervious as to render the interpretation of their symbolical imagery extremely difficult and uncertain. The slender thread of truth being intimately blended and confused with an incongruous mass of error, the elucidation was a task so complicated and forbidding that few had the courage to undertake it, and men were rather inclined to bow implicitly to popular tradition that be at the pains to reconcile truth with itself and separate. With a nice and delicate hand, the particles of genuine knowledge from the cumbrous web of allegory and superstition in which they were interwoven. The darkness of masonry is invested with a more pure and dignified reference because it is attached to a system of truth. It places before the mind a series of the most awful and impressive images. It points to the darkness of death and the obscurity of the grave as the forerunners of a more brilliant and never fading light which follows at the resurrection of the just. Figure to yourselves the beauty and strict propriety of this reference, ye who have been raised to the third degree of masonry. Was your mind enveloped in the shades of that darkness? So shall you again be involved in the darkness of the grave, when death has drawn his sable curtain round you. Did you rise to a splendid scene of intellectual brightness? So, if you are obedient to the precepts of masonry and the dictates of religion, shall you rejoice on the resurrection morn. When the clouds of error and imperfection are separated from your mind, and you behold with unveiled eye the glories which issue from the expanse of heaven, the everlasting splendors of the throne of God. It is an extraordinary fact that there is scarcely a single ceremony in Freemasonry, but we find its corresponding rite in one or other of the idolatrous mysteries and the coincidence can only be accounted for by supposing that these mysteries were derived from masonry. Yet, however they might assimilate in ceremonial observances, an essential difference existed in the fundamental principles of the respective institution. The primitive veneration for light accompanied the career of masonry from the creation to the present day and will attend its course until time expires in eternity. But in the mysteries of idolatry, 
This veneration soon yielded its empire over men's minds and fell before the claims of darkness. For a false worship would naturally be productive of impure feelings and vicious propensities. It is true indeed that the first Egyptians worshipped On as the chief deity, who was supposed to be the eternal light, and hence he was referred to the sun as its great source and emanation. Thus it was said that God dwelt in the light, his virtue in the sun, and his wisdom in the moon. But this worship was soon debased by superstitious practices. The idolaters degenerated into an adoration of serpents and scorpions and other representatives of the evil spirit. And amidst the same professions of a profound reverence for light became most unaccountably enamored of darkness. And a temple near Memphis was dedicated to the Hecate Scotia which was styled the Lord of the creation and in some respects deemed oracular. Hence we deduce the strict propriety of the ninth plague inflicted by almighty vengeance on that infatuated people in which it is most remarkable to observe that the same terrific sights were exhibited before their affrighted senses. The same unearthly noises sounded in their ears as usually attended the rites of initiation into the Egyptian mysteries. With the same reference in view, the Almighty, many centuries afterwards, denounces his vengeance on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. I will cover the heavens when I quench thee, and I will clothe the stars thereof with black. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the shining lights of the heavens will I clothe with black over thee, and will set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord Jehovah. This superstition, which assigned divine honors to darkness, was not peculiar to Egypt, but spread by a kind of fatality throughout the idolatrous world, and was justified on the principle that darkness or night which had an existence in chaos long before the creation of light, was hence of superior antiquity. Thus, in their calculations, they gave precedence to the night, and to signify one full revolution of the earth on its axis, they used the phrase, a night and a day, which the Greeks expressed by the word, nuch thermon. Even the Jews began their calculations from the evening, because God is said by Moses to have created light out of darkness. And they beheld the darkness itself with the most awful sensations and considered it as the incomprehensible veil of the deity. They thought the greatest mystery of religion was expressed by adumbration vis-a-vis -vis the cherubim shadowing the mercy seat. Life was considered but the shadow of death and souls departed but the shadow of the living, the sun itself but the dark simulacrum, and light but the shadow of God. The honors thus conferred on darkness are plainly set forth in the Orphic fragments, where night is celebrated as the parent of gods and men and the origin of all things, and hence in the initiations Darkness was always held with three distinct acclamations or cheers. For these united causes, Jesus Christ says that in his time, at the extreme point of degeneracy, which mankind were suffered to attain, men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And speaking of the implacable and revengeful spirit inculcated by idolatry, St. John the beloved disciple of Christ says, He that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. The same reference is abundant in all St. Paul's epistles, which are addressed to the heathen converts. From these observations, the customs that follow may be satisfactorily accounted for. In all the ancient mysteries, before an aspirant could claim to participate in the higher secrets of the institution, 
he was placed within the pastos or bed or coffin, or in other words, was subjected to a solitary confinement for a prescribed period of time that he might reflect seriously in seclusion and darkness on what he was about to undertake and be reduced to a proper state of mind for the reception of great and important truths by a course of fasting and mortification. This was the symbolical death of the mysteries, and his deliverance from confinement was the act of regeneration or being born again, or, as it was also termed, being raised from the dead. Clement of Alexandria tells us, that in the formulary used by one who had been initiated, he was taught to say, I have descended into the bedchamber. The ceremony here alluded to was doubtless the same as the descent into Hades, and I am inclined to think that when the aspirant entered into the mystic cell, he was directed to lay himself down upon the bed which shadowed out the tomb or coffin of the great father. This process was equivalent to his entering into the infernal ship, and while stretched upon the holy couch, in imitation of his figurative deceased prototype, he was said to be wrapped in the deep sleep of death. His resurrection from the bed was his restoration to life, or his regeneration into a new world, and it was virtually the same as his return from Hades, or his emerging from the gloomy cavern or his liberation from the womb of the ship goddess. The candidate was made to undergo these changes in scenic representation and was placed under the pastos in perfect darkness, generally for the space of three days and nights. The time of this solitary confinement, however, varied in different nations. In Britain, nine days and nights was the specified period. In Greece, three times nine days, while in Persia it was extended to fifty days and nights of darkness, want of rest and fasting. To explain the nature of these places of penance and mortification, I need not carry you to distant shores. The remains in our country are both numerous and open to public inspection, for I have no doubt. But the British Cromlech was the identical vehicle of preparation for the druidical mysteries. A celebrated piece of antiquity was recently standing near Maidstone called Kit's Cadi House. This was a dark chamber of probation, for Kit is no other than Ked or Seridwin, the British series, and Koti or Seti meant an ark or a chest. Hence, the compound word referred to the Ark of the Diluvian god Noah, whose mysterious rites were celebrated in Britain, and Seridwin was either the consort of Noah or the Ark itself, symbolically the great mother of mankind. The peculiar names which these monuments still retain throughout the kingdom are a decisive proof that they were appropriated almost exclusively to this purpose. Had they been commonly used for altars, some marks of the operation of fire would still have been visible on their upper surface, which is not the case. Were they merely sepulchral monuments, the remains of interred bodies would be discovered under all of them without exception, and such interments have been very rarely found. To establish this point more satisfactorily, I will enumerate a few of them. At a village in Somersetshire called Stanton Drew or Druid Stones, we find a specimen of this structure, which consisted originally of three circles of stones and a pastos or aditum. Another in Cardiganshire called Lek e Gowers, the flat stone of the giantess, Seridwin, at the village of Shap in Westmoreland, in another termed Carl Loft, a name also applicable to the pastos. The phallus was the gross symbol under which Noah, or the great father of the mysteries, was worshipped, and it was usually represented by a pyramidal stone. Now, in some of the most ancient dialects of Britain, 
Cal signified the phallus and Liv the deluge. And hence, according to this etymology, Cal Liv modernized into Carl Loft simply meant the phallus or memorial of the deluge. The list might be increased almost indefinitely. Coincidences like these are too striking to be overlooked, particularly when we consider that the initiation formed a most important and essential part of religious worship, and no person could hold any dignified appointment as priest or legislator without passing through these forms, which included as an indispensable preliminary rite the solitary confinement of the darkened pastos. Warburton says that the pagans appear to have thought initiation as necessary as the Christians did baptism. The initiations were therefore very numerous and the places where they were performed not only abounded in every part of the island but were invested with a high degree of imaginary sanctity, particularly the editum, which was represented as being the peculiar abode of spirits and guarded by a vindictive divinity armed with the sword of justice. A devotional feeling for these consecrated places would descend from father to son for many generations after the knowledge of their particular use, which was known only to the initiated, had been lost or obscured by time or the prevalence of the Christian religion whose complete success was involved in consigning to oblivion every vestige of these ceremonial rites which might tend to keep alive in the mind the object of every mystical celebration. Hence, from the inhumation of the aspirant, which was esteemed equivalent with an actual internment, the chromlech was said to be sepulchral. But this conjecture, after many revolving ages, having fallen into disrepute from the ill success of antiquarian research, which was almost universally disappointed in its attempts to discover the crumbling remains of decayed bodies within the area of its enclosure. It was then assumed that these monuments must necessarily have been altars for sacrifice, for the notion of their being sanctified appendages to religion was never lost, and it was not supposed that they could be applied to any other purpose in the rites of divine worship. The emblems here offered to your notice are the coffin with the skull and crossbones, the hourglass, the sith, the beehive, and the sprig of acacia. The coffin, skull, and crossbones are emblems of mortality and cry out with the voice almost more than mortal, prepare to meet thy God. The hourglass is an emblem of human life. We cannot without astonishment behold the little particles which are contained in this machine pass away almost imperceptibly and yet to our surprise in the short space of an hour are all exhausted. Thus waste human life. At the end of man's short hour death strikes the blow and hurries him off the stage to his long and darksome resting place. The Sith is an emblem of time, which cuts the brittle thread of life and launches us into eternity. What havoc does the Sith of time make among the human race? If by chance we escape the numerous evils incident to childhood and youth and arrive in perfect health and strength at the years of vigorous manhood, yet decrepit old age will soon follow and we must be cut down by the all-devouring Sith of time and be gathered into the land where our fathers are gone before us. The beehive is an emblem of industry and recommends the practice of that virtue to all created beings, from the highest seraph in heaven to the lowest reptile in the dust. It teaches us that as we came into the world rational and intelligent beings, so we should ever be industrious ones, never sitting down contented while our fellow creatures around us are in want when it is in our power to relieve them without inconvenience to ourselves. This was a famous symbol in the Orphic Mysteries, into which it had been introduced with a mysterious reference well worthy of our consideration. 
We learn from one of the ancient oracles collected by Opsopius that honey was used in the sacrifices to Bacchus and the nymphs. And Sophocles informs us that libations of honey and water were made in honor of the Irenuius, which tremendous deities were in reality archite deities. According to Porphyry, honey was introduced into the mysteries as a symbol of death, on which account it was offered to the infernal gods. This notion will show us the reason why the Chaldeans, who were deeply versed in the Kabiric orgies, were accustomed to embalm their dead with honey. The death, however, celebrated in the mysteries of which honey was the symbol, was not, I apprehend, a literal but merely an allegorical death. The death, in short of Bacchus, Adonis, and Osiris, or in other words, the confinement of Noah within his ark or coffin. Such a death as this, therefore, was very naturally described as being sweet, for it was, in fact, a preservation from danger. In allusion to the symbolical honey, Samothrace, the grand seat of the Kabiric superstition, was once denominated Melita, and for precisely the same reason, Jupiter was sometimes feigned to have been fed during his infancy by a swarm of bees. These bees, as we learn from Porphyry, were nothing more than the mystic priestesses of the infernal Ceres, who were called Melissae or Melite, a name which, according to a custom familiar to the pagans, they seem to have assumed from the deity whom they served. Ceres, Venus, or Astarte, was styled by the Babylonians Melita, or the goddess of generation. And as the Kabiric priest assumed the title of Kabiri, Kirites, or Corybantes, so the priestesses of Melita called themselves Melissae, or Melite. The name was afterwards extended to bees, which animals, from their great vigor, activity, and liveliness, were thought to be proper emblems of what the Epopte termed newborn souls. Porphyry concludes his remarks upon the bees of the mysteries by observing that the Epopte did not consider them emblematical of all souls in general, but only of the just. The reason why this distinction was made is evidence. The bees symbolized only the just man and his pious family, not the incorrigible race which perished beneath the waves of the deluge. The sprig of acacia points to that state of moral obscurity to which the world was reduced previously to the appearance of Christ upon the earth, when the reverence and adoration due to the divinity was buried in the filth and rubbish of the world, when religion sat mourning in Israel in sackcloth and ashes, and morality was scattered to the four winds of heaven. In order that mankind might be preserved from this deplorable state of darkness and destruction, and as the old law was dead and became rottenness, a new doctrine and new precepts were wanting to give the key to salvation, in the language of which we might touch the ear of an offended deity and bring forth hope for eternity. True religion was fled. Those who sought her through the wisdom of the ancients were not able to raise her. She eluded the grasp, and their polluted hands were stretched forth in vain for her restoration. Those who sought her by the old law were frustrated, for death had stepped between, and corruption had defiled the embrace. Sin had beset her steps, and the vices of the world had overwhelmed her. The great father of all, commiserating the miseries of the world, sent his only son, who was innocence, acacia itself, to teach the doctrines of salvation, by whom man was raised from the death of sin unto a life of righteousness, from the tomb of corruption unto the chambers of hope, from the darkness of despair to the celestial beams of faith, and not only working for us this redemption, but making with us the covenant of regeneration, whence we became the children of God and inheritors of the realms of heaven. 
I cannot conclude this lecture without adding a few words by way of application on the darkness of death, which will as certainly precede your resurrection as it did figuratively when your masonry was completed. Are you rich and blessed with an abundant superfluidity of earthly possessions? To you, the approach of death will be bitter indeed, if it find you unprepared, because it would deprive you of all your temporal comforts without the promise of an equivalent in eternity. Are you poor? Still, the apprehension of this event conveys a portion of dismay, which it is difficult entirely to remove. We anticipate with a strong feeling of horror those bitter agonies, those dreadful pangs, which precede and accompany dissolution. We behold with terror the angel of death approach our dwelling, and when he lays hold on to us to hasten our struggling nature away, we shrink from his grasp and cling to the world with a delirious embrace, as if all our hopes and wishes were centered in its riches and gratifications. We do not reflect with sensations of pleasure on that event which excludes us from the light of heaven and consigns us to the damps and darkness of the grave in which our body must eventually be deposited to be food for worms and to encounter corruption and decay. We shudder at the thought of being placed in the earth and covered over with mold. And when the green sod is laid upon our grave to have taken a last and eternal farewell of the world and its inhabitants. But we have a still greater dread of this event when we reflect on the eternal destruction of the soul. We know it must be separated from the body. We know that its doom, once pronounced, is irrevocable. And we recoil from the prospect of the second death with consternation and horror. A few brief instructions how to subdue these feelings may be neither improper nor unacceptable at the conclusion of this lecture. Fear God and keep his commandments, says a certain degree of masonry, after King Solomon, for this is the whole duty of man. I would recommend to you the practice of temperance, not so much to preserve your constitution untainted as to prepare for its final dissolution. I would recommend the practice of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you not so much to preserve the peace in order to civil society, which notwithstanding it cannot fail to do, as to inspire in your own bosoms a love of virtue and goodwill to men. I would recommend benevolence and charity, not merely to provide for the necessities of indigence, but to introduce into your soul the fine feelings of humanity and an extended philanthropy which may embrace in the bonds of love the whole human race. In a word, I would press upon you the practice of virtue, and not so much for its own sake, as in obedience to the divine command and in humble imitation of Jesus Christ, whose beneficence was extended to his most obdurate enemies, and who has promised everlasting happiness to all who follow his pure and holy example. If then to your faith you add the virtues of a good life, if you do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God, you have a protection against the fear of death, which nothing earthly can remove or take away. For you have the promise of scripture that in this case, your latter end shall be in peace. Death is divested of its thing. And as your pulse advances to its dying throb, you will serenely await the awful moment when the soul takes wing into the boundless and unexplored expanse. And in silent meditation, you will reflect I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day.